Hello, let's go ahead. We'll continue our tutorials in econometrics. And we're going to talk a little bit about the assumptions behind linear regression. Now, the linear regression model is said to be something called blue. All right, it's the best linear unbiased estimator under a certain set of assumptions. And we call these the, cla the, you know, the classical assumptions of linear regression. And if these things are true, then linear regression is the best model. All right, provably so. Um, there will not be a better model that is also unbiased. And this goes back to a lot of theory. It really goes back to something called Gauss-Markov theorem. Um, and that's the basis for this proof to, to show this mathematically. We're not going to go into any of that. I am going to talk a little bit about the assumptions. And a lot of what econometrics and I think statistics in general at this point is about is figuring out, OK, does the data comport to these assumptions and when it doesn't what do we do about it so let's go ahead and have a quick look so yep we're going to analyze those um, um, assumptions and the first thing we want to know what makes OLS ordinary least squares blue a best linear unbiased estimator all right so let's go ahead here's the classical assumptions number one the dependent variables are linearly related to the coefficients um, of the model uh, and the, um, of the dependent variables. Okay, so in other words, we can come up with a linear combination of the um, um, independent variables that correctly describes the relationship they have with the dependent variable. Okay, we've talked about this for, before. Basically, if we're going to use a linear model, there better be a linear relationship. And if there isn't a linear relationship, we either need to do one of two things, not use a linear model or linearize the relationship in some way. All right, this is why in economics, we oftentimes use log transformations because log transformations take essentially take things that look like they're growing exponentially and make them look like they're growing more linearly. Um, and in econ, we deal with a lot of things that exhibit exponential growth. Um, the next thing is no perfect multicollinearity. Okay, so this one, I'm going to go into just a little teeny bit more math than, than normal. Actually, no, I'm going to wait on that one because I talk about this in just a, uh, I talk about this in another slide. So I'm going to hold off on multicollinearity. So just a second. The next one, the mean of the error terms is zero. Okay, and notice what I'm doing here is I'm writing the assumption. Oh, let me get my pen going. I'm writing the assumption. Ooh, no, not yellow on black on white. No, not yellow snow. Yellow snow never. Eey. Okay, never mind. Sorry. I have a five-year-old, so the frozen references just sometimes randomly pop out. Okay, so in any event, we have a written version of the assumption, and then I have the math. Um, the math is not horribly, horribly important for this class and this level because for the most part, we're keeping things at the applied level. So I need the mean of the error terms to be zero. Um, they won't be exactly zero, okay? Because the, the, you know this, when I actually estimate the model from a sample is a random variable. So it's gonna you know have some fluctuation around that zero, but it needs to look pretty close to zero. This is why I harp so hard on plot the residuals. And that residual versus fitted um, plot is so great for this because we can see how those, those residuals center around zero. We can also do a couple other plots, especially when we get into, say, chapter 9, when we start talking about time series data. And, and really, you can think of that as the order of the observations matter. All right, so the observations in the data set are in a particular order. We'll, we'll plot these residuals over time um, because we want to see what that's doing as well because we've got you know basically different domains we have to um, examine all of this stuff in. But we just want these residuals to be centered around zero. Now, why is that? Well, because if they're not, there's bias. Let's say these average out to two. Oh, come on. There you go. To two. Well, here's the thing. I could just take my model, all right? So, you know, I'm just going to call that y hat, all right? That's just going to stand in for my model right now. It's got all of this, you know, this stuff up here in it. Subtract 2 and get a better estimate. 
So obviously I'm doing something pretty stupid. Okay, so that's that's why these need to um, center around zero. Um, you know, usually having a constant in there, unless you have lots of really, really goofy things going on with your data, takes care of that. You know, if you've got growth or trend, maybe you need a trend term in there or you have to do some kind of differencing or something like that also to, to take care of this, this problem. Um, but really, you just want an unbiased estimate. And if this isn't zero, you know there's some bias there. There's information there. There's pattern that you can discern. Um, the next thing is you want a constant variance. This is called heteroscedasticity. We're going to have a whole chapter on heteroscedasticity and autocorrelation. Um, it's a sign that there may be a problem or there may not be. Either way, we have to deal with it. But this is a... Um, uh, uh, an issue that we will have to deal with. And that's where, when, especially when we looked at that residual versus fit plot, remember that we had one where that, that plot, the, the residuals kind of made this kind of, uh, you know, trumpety looking triangle delta or something looking kind of um, pattern. That's heteroscedasticity. We don't want that. Right. If we can fix it, we want to fix it. If we can't fix it, we'll have to just, account, we'll have to account for it. But generally, it means, hey, there's something more going on there that we can do something about. Next, we've talked about this a little bit too. These air terms need to be normally distributed. Um, and they'll have a normal distribution of zero, um, sigma squared, where sigma squared is the, um, R calls this the um, um, residual standard error. Um, I think mostly in the textbooks, we're going to call that the standard error of regression. Um, and you can see that's this variance up here. And you can see why R calls it the residual standard error because it's the, the um, well, actually, it's the variance of those. Um, sigma is that. Um, sigma squared is the variance. And actually, this is not quite right. We would normally do it with the standard deviation, not the, not the variance, but that's OK. Um, We'll just cross that out for right now. And any event, well, I'll come back to it. Any event, it's not that important. Basically, this normally distributed is not absolutely necessary. The the one or two tests that we're going to talk about that really require normal distribution, actually, people have come along later and come up with tests that are robust to this normality. The biggest thing you want to do with this, and we've talked about it before, is plot that histogram of the residuals. And if you see something really, really screwy in it, that might be a red flag to go back and look at something else. Though, to be honest, in my, my experience, usually if there's something really, really screwy in that um, histogram, then you will have seen it in one of the other plots that I make you do. But, you know, um, you know if, you've got, if you can test it once, that's great. If you can test it five different ways, hey, that's even better, right? Um, but this is not one to get absolutely worried about. The next one we'll talk about, um, oh, what is this? Uh, when we get into things like simultaneity bias um, and, and whatnot. Let's see. Uh, oh, no, no, no. I'm sorry. My bad. I'm not quite there yet. This one, I'm, I'm on seven, not six. Six is that we want the, the, these air terms to be uncorrelated with one another. Um, this is what we call no serial correlation, no auto correlation or serial correlation. So when we come back and we talk about heteroscedasticity, we'll also talk about auto and serial correlation. Um, basically, what that means is there's a specific kind of pattern in the data that we could probably figure out how to extract. Um, so we're probably throwing information away if there is serial correlation in the data. Now, that's not entirely true because sometimes you just get data that's serially correlated and there is nothing you can do about it. And so then we just account for it. OK, um, but um, for the most part, this is a very specific kind of pattern. Now, this is one of those patterns that sometimes sometimes you can see it in the, the plots. You know, so you might have a residual versus fit plot, right, that the they go, you know, kind of like this. You know, they make a, a whooping pattern or some kind of swooping pattern, something like that. Sometimes you can see this. A lot of times you can't. Um, and so we'll test for this one. Okay. 
And then finally, we come down here to the independent variables are uncorrelated to the error terms. This is really, really uber important. What we call, this comes back to a problem called an endogeneity problem. In other words, one of our first assumptions that we need is that our independent variables are not random, right? We know them. There are given information. Well, if those independent variables actually aren't exactly random, in fact, they're kind of part of a system where everything kind of determines everything else, we can have some problems. You know, if they're actually what we call endogenous right-hand side variables, well, then we get this problem. Um, there's other reasons why we could have um, the independent variables being correlated with our error terms, and that just really causes some issues. Um, so to take care of that, we're going to have to use something like, if it's say simultaneity bias, so we've got a system of the, 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 all these variables are coming from a system of equations, like say a demand and supply system. Um, maybe we need to use two-stage least squares. We'll talk about that a little bit. Um, generally, what we're going to use, oops, sorry. Generally, what we're going to use to deal with that would be um, an instrumental variable type approach. We call that IV. Um, and I find instrumental variables to be maddeningly imprecise um, because it's very easy to say what a good instrumental variable is theoretically. In practical terms, it can be really, really difficult to figure out whether or not an instrument is actually good or not. But that notwithstanding, we'll talk about that a little bit, um, you know, a little bit later in the, the semester. This is a pretty advanced topic. Okay, now, if you didn't get all of that from that whirlwind tour, that's okay. We're actually going to, well, we're going to have, we've talked about this one already. Um, we're going to have a whole chapter on this one. We're going to have a whole chapter on this one. Um, we've got a couple of chapters on that one. All right. This one up here, we've already talked about a little bit when we talk about, you know, just plotting the residuals. And let's see, let me get rid of my scribbles. And we're about to talk about multicollinearity. Oh, and we're going to have a whole section in chapter six on multicollinearity. So, you know, if this little whirlwind tour was a little too whirlwind for you. Don't don't worry. Right here, I want you to see the forest. Um, don't worry. We're going to get lost in the trees here in a bit. Okay, so two assumptions I want to talk about where we're going to talk about the explanatory variables. Um, number one, these explanatory variables are not random variables. That goes back to that, that number seven assumption that we just talked about. Um, if they're being determined inside of this system and they are actually a random variable within the system, well, that makes things a whole lot more complicated. Think about it like this. My random variables are what's given to me. They're my knowns. If my knowns aren't known, then what do I know? I know, a little freaky, right? Okay, so that's why this assumption is actually pretty important. And until we get into like, say, chapter 10, chapter 11, and I can't even remember how deep we go into those um, in my lesson planning, um, we're just going to assume that the explanatory variables are not random. They're not what we call endogenous. And I'm using this word so the econ students will know what endogenous and exogenous means. But let me, let me just talk about this. We have a model or we have, you know, a goopy thing that, determine stuff, right? You know, call it a world, call it an economy, call it a universe, I don't care, all right? We have something that we're modeling and we have variables inside of that model. Some of those are givens, you know, the gravitational constant of the universe, that's a given. I don't know why it's a given, I'm not a physicist, but it's a given as far as I'm concerned. Um, you know, physicists want to say, hey, it's not, then that's their problem. But for my sake, my, my small little Newtonian mind, it's a given. Okay, well, all right, um, that's known. Well, that's exogenous to the system, right? It's outside of, well, my, my understanding of, the, of reality um, versus something determined inside the system. Okay, so let me bring this back to a more economics example that will make a little more sense. Let's take um, a forecast of GDP. Um, if I want to look at a forecast of GDP, things that are internal to the system might be unemployment. 
They might be, um, oh, I don't know, um, productivity. Uh, there's, there's just, you know, number of variables. Those might all be kind of internally driven within the system. Something that's external to the system, um, you know, an asteroid shock. You know, an asteroid comes and hits the Earth and causes a huge uh, nat uh, natural calamity. Um, okay, all right, that would be exogenous quite literally exogenous because it's completely outside the earth. Um, a pandemic, all right? I would consider that to be an exogenous variable. We're not really accounting for on a, you know, year in, year out basis, you know, a 100 year pandemic hitting. Um, so those are things that are determined outside the system, exo, um, meaning outside. Um, endogenous things are determined inside the system. Our explanatory variables are assumed to be exogenous, determined outside the system, independent of our dependent variable. Okay, great. Next, any one of the explanatory variables is not an exact linear function of another, all right? So if we have perfect multicollinearity, now, when economist says multicollinearity, all they mean is correlation, all right? Um, if two, two variables are collinear with one another that means they're correlated and the thing is we just can't have too high a correlation if we do then the math breaks down so inside that the, that OLS there is a matrix x transpose x if you know any linear algebra this is great um, if you don't don't worry about it if I have perfect multicollinearity between um, two of my variables inside that x inside that x matrix, and x transpose x becomes a square matrix. Then x transpose x is not full break, therefore not invertible, and therefore I can't can't calculate x transpose x inverse, and so I can't calculate x um, beta hat OLS, which is x transpose x inverse x transpose y. Okay, that's all the math I'm going to talk about. If you want to know more, schedule an appointment with me. Um, I'll go through the math with you, but. Um, you don't really need to know it. Basically, what will happen is if you have perfect multicollinearity, most computer algorithms are just going to drop one of the variables. Um, I think that's wrong. I think what it should do is say, error, you have perfect multicollinearity. Go fix it, stupid human. Um, unfortunately, the computer, most computer programs realized, or programmers realized that calling the user a stupid human is not a good idea in terms of customer service, and so it just drops the variable automatically for you. Um, but in any event, there are some issues, and we'll talk about it when we don't have perfect multicollinearity. We just have really, really high correlation between our, our variables. We'll talk about that more. I think I might talk about it a little bit in this, in this um, presentation, but in Chapter 6, we have a section on multicollinearity. OK, oops, let's get rid of that. Oh, Andy's big hamburger sales. Okay, uh, we have some great data sets. We got Andy's hamburgers, and we got one coming up on beer. So you know, if you like beer, hey, I got I got your thing. And if you're underage, it's root beer. Promise. Okay, name it. So let's talk about our data. Um, first of all, there's actually a package on on Cran called POE Five R Data. All right, principles of econometrics. Fifth edition, I know you guys have the fourth edition. Don't worry about it. I'm taking care of that for you. Um, R, as in, you know, R. Um, and then data, as in, well, you know, not the Android, but, you know, the data. Um, and that actually just kind of loads all of the data sets from this book into your um, R installation um, as built-ins. And then I can just use this function data to create the um, um, data frame Andy, which has sales, price, and advertisement budgets for Andy's hamburger stand. OK, and so that's great. So why did I pull it down as a CSV file and show you how to do it as a CSV file? Because in general, there is not a CRAN package out there with the data that you need to use for this. You're much more likely to have to pull it in as a um, um, CSV file or something like that than you are to be able to do it like this. Um, so why am I doing it this way now? Because I'm lazy. Okay, and I'm using data table and the head function to make it pretty. All right, isn't that pretty? That's nice. Okay, if you want to know more about that, I talk about that in another um, um, tutorial or just make an appointment with me and I'll, I'll be happy to help you. Okay, 
So let's keep going. I'm going to go ahead and we're going to add, estimate a model. We've done this before. We're going to put sales on price and advertisement. Okay. Sales, price, and advertisement. We tell it that the data is Andy. And we're going to put that in mod one. And then I'm going to store in summary S mod one, the summary of mod one. And I'm going to use JTools. All right, so JTools is a package and it has this nice little, little thing called sum, which I think sum as an S U M M, so short for summary, not short for summation, right? So um, I know it freaks me out, but in any event, that's why there's two M's there. And I think it produces a little nicer output than does the, um, uh, than does the, um, you know, the, the standard built in summary package. Okay, or summary function in, in base R. It's not in a package, it's in base R. And so here we go, um, gives us all this cool stuff. Uh, this is just the basic output, isn't this nice? And everything is significant. Oh, isn't this wonderful? Great. I want you to pause the video for just a minute. All right, well actually wait to pause the video until I tell you again, because um, I need to ask you a question. Does this model make sense? Now, for my econ students, I really want you to think about this. Does this make sense? I want you to think about the fact that we have a linear relationship between price and advertisement. So what do I want you to look at? Number one, all right, look at the sign of each of my coefficients. We don't have to worry about the intercept for just yet. Do those make sense? Number two, Think about this over the whole um, range of predictions for um, sales, our Y hat. Does it make sense? And the third thing I want you to ask yourself is, if this model is the correct model, what does it imply the correct strategy for advertisement is? Pause the video for a second and think about all those things. Yeah, don't worry. I'll wait. I'm here. What I really need is the the, the Jeopardy theme song. Um, for one of my classes last semester, I actually had it up on a as a link. You know, I could just push it and then start playing the Jeopardy theme song. Yeah, I'm a nerd, I know, but that's okay. Okay, so you've paused the video or fast forwarded through all of this crap um, and thought about this a bit. What is the implication? Well, first of all, price being negative. Well, that kind of makes sense. You know, whole law of demand thing, you know, price goes up. Quantity demand goes down. Okay, yeah. So they should move in opposite directions, which is what that negative sign means. And that makes sense. Yeah, cool. What about a linear relationship with advertisement? Well, first of all, it's positive. That makes sense, doesn't it? If I advertise more, I should sell more. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, does it, though? If I advertise $10,000, should I get more than if I advertise $5,000? If I advertise $100,000, should I get more than if I advertise $10,000? Maybe a little bit. If I advertise a million, should I get more than um, $10,000? Depends on how big I am. $10 million? $100 million? A billion? A quadrillion? How about I set my advertising budget to a Googleplex? You know, a one with 100 zeros behind it. What this says is that sales goes up infinitely, all right? So for every dollar increase in advertisement, I get 1.86 increase in um, in sales. Okay, sounds good. I should, I should set my advertising budget to infinity and then my sales will be infinity, yeah? Um, and as long as I'm making a positive profit on each one of those units, my profit is infinite. Okay, that obviously can't be right, right? So on its face, this model just doesn't work because we know there needs to be diminishing returns to advertisement, right? We know there should be these diminishing returns. So now we have, we can go back to one of our previous ones where we're talking about the, you know, the, the functional form. Well, we have a theoretical foundation for saying the linear functional form obviously is wrong. Okay, so we need to we need to figure out something better than this model to go on based on the theory. 
That's why this is important. You need theory and statistics. All right, so let's take a little closer look at the data. This is a this is a plot. It's ugly as sin, but I absolutely love it. Um, it just it's so easy, and there's so much information here. Um, it comes from the Psych package. All right, so the Psych package, and they're, they're called Paris panels, and you just pass it a data frame. All right, so we give it the Andes data, and what it's going to do is it's going to give me a matrix of plots along the diagonal. It's going to give me a histogram of each of the data points, each of the variables in my um, sample. All right, so here I have sales, price, and advertisement. This is how they're distributed. You know, that's actually pretty nice information. It also tries to draw like a, you know, a, a, an estimate of the probability distribution, something or other. You know, that's that's mildly useful. Don't worry about it. Um, just kind of have a look at how they're distributed. Are they all reasonably reasonable? Is there skew? Is you know you can you can tell a little bit about it. You know if you know, you have a distribution where you have exactly one bar. One you know it all falls within one bar because they're all the same value. Oh well, that's not good. Um, but here we have they all look fine. Um, then we can look down here to the bottom part of this matrix and it gives us each one of the pairwise scatter plots and it kind of fits a weirdo line through the two um, and so the closer this is to a straight line the closer the relationship the scatter plot indicates a um, linear relationship the steeper the line is either positive or negatively the stronger the correlation between the two the flatter it is the weaker the correlation between the two. And um, let's see, you know, you just you can also just look at the dots. Um, I don't really worry about the dot or the oval. Um, that has to do with the means of the two to, to two variables. And then the oval is, you know, kind of a confidence ellipse for that dot. But yeah, we just, just don't worry about those for right now. Just kind of look at the scatter plots. I mean, we can see this one. All right, between advertisement and price, there's just like no relationship whatsoever. It's just like uh, between advertisement and sales. You know, that's not the strongest relationship I've ever seen. Now, we have to be careful because these are pairwise. When we put all of them together, it sometimes is much, it, it, the, the relationship is different. Okay. And then finally, up here at the top, we have the correlation coefficients. All right, so sales has a, a negative 0.63 correlation with price. Okay, that makes sense. Reasonably strong um, correlation, and it's negative. As price goes up, sales go down. That's the law of demand. Okay, great. And then we can look at these other two. Um, so um, advertisement, positive correlation, not zero. That that makes sense. And then advertisement and price, almost zero. That's That's actually pretty good for us right now. Does so that make sense? This is just a neat plot. I highly recommend doing this plot every time you just look at a data set. You're probably not going to put this like in your paper or in your report or anything like that. But this is just a great plot just to get to know the data. It's always important. Take some time. Get to know your data set. Okay, let's look at the residual versus fit plot for mod one. Um, and it's overall not horrible. All right, this is why we 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 don't rely on any one thing. We don't rely on just the plots. We don't rely on just the tests. We don't rely on just the uh, the theory. We, we look at all of it. And in this case, we know we have a theoretical problem with this model. At the very least, we're going to be limited in the range that, of, of values for advertisement we can use to predict sales with. At the very least, we know that from this model. So maybe what this is indicating is this model is fine as long as we don't try to predict a value of advertisement that's too much below 0.5 or too much above 3.0. All right, as long as we stay kind of within this range that we've observed, maybe we're reasonably okay, but still we know we have a theoretical problem that we can fix pretty easily, so we should probably do that. 
All right, but here it doesn't. This really doesn't look that bad. Okay, so well, wait a minute. Let's do a little more complicated model. What about the quadratic model? So we've talked about that. Here we go. Oh, look at that. The quadratic term is definitely significant. All right, that makes some sense because at some point we're going to get diminishing returns from advertisement. We're not always going to get, you know, an additional dollar of advertisement is not always going to give us more advertising. So what this tells us is that at low levels of advertising, we get pretty high return to advertising. But at high levels of advertising, we get less return for that advertising. Um, and it eventually becomes a negative return. Um, and that very much more fits our, our theory of how, of the economic theory of how this model should work. Okay, so we look here at our residual versus fit plot. Eh, it's, neither of them are perfect. This one's marginally better, I think. Um, one of the things I'll notice is we have fewer observations down here than we have up here. Um, that might be just an artifact of the, the, the data set that we've collected, you know, where the data is. We just don't have a lot of observations of values in the, you know, the 65 and 70 range. Certainly could be the, the issue. But we have a few outliers down there. Um, that could be part of it. Um, but overall, overall, I say this one looks just a little bit better. Um, but even if you want to argue with me over that, Theoretically, I'm uh, on much safer ground using this this model. Okay, um, and I I the the book kind of skips the obvious example for this one. Um, so I'll give you as a homework: try this, Andy, just on your own. You know, you don't have to turn it in or anything. Um, with the the log of advertisement, Let's see what that does. Okay, um, also. Especially econ students, think about why why would I use log versus quadratic? And why would I prefer the log over the quadratic? All right. Or why not? Okay. We can talk about that in class.